what we do and why we do it. So my story actually, it starts right here in Santa Ana. I'm a single mother. I have one son and he, we lived right on Lyon Street. Um, he eventually became a heroin addict. He was homeless, living right here in Santa Ana. And uh, at that time, I had to go back to Chicago for a year because both of my parents were very sick and we had to downsize them and you know move them into a nursing home. And So I took a year to take care of my dad and he has Alzheimer's. And, uh, you know, I got that year with my dad while he still knew who I was. And you never know what's going on in people's lives and you're so busy doing the hustle, trying to survive out here. Well, your, your own family could be going through some issues that maybe they're missing you too. So, um, you know, I made a choice. I went back for a year and, and I thought my son was gonna be safe in a rehab and he bounced after a couple of weeks and nobody told me. Um, so he, for five or six months, I had no idea where he was and you know, I found out after about three weeks that he had left. So I knew for a long time I, that he was out there somewhere, hopefully alive. I didn't know. He had a lot of clean time because he had just done a lot of time in jail. And uh, when you go to rehab and then you spend all that time in jail and you have about seven or eight months of clean time, well, there's a big likelihood you could die of an overdose because you just don't have that resistance or tolerance. So, you know, of course, every mother's nightmare is getting that phone call. You know, you don't know where your kid is, but somebody calls and says he's here in the morgue or something. So anyways, this lady um, out here in California found him for me, and I told her, I'm going to pay this forward. I'm going to find a way to find other kids like you find my kid because you can't put a price on a mother's peace of mind. Let me tell you that. You can sleep, you can eat, you can actually look at other people and, and feel joy. Because whether you know it or not, whatever happiness or events that are going on in your family's lives, there's always a hole. You know, holidays come, there's an empty chair around the table, birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, anything. You know, you know that there's a piece of the puzzle missing. And it's never fun. It's never fun for the family to really think what's going on here. Why is this person not here? So um, once I realized that this woman was able to find my son, I thought, well, why can't I find other people's kids like she did? So I came up with the idea to put these messages on sandwiches. And we would make a couple hundred lunches and put these text switch messages uh, notes and on these lunch bags and distribute them and um, before you know it people would say oh this guy looks familiar look here look there and uh, I found my first guy his name was Shaggy actually Shaggy is somebody that came to the tent city a couple of weeks ago he was the first person I found but he w was missing and then he was lost and you can actually be missing and lost, and here's why. I knew exactly where he was after I found him. He didn't want help. He was still lost. He was living on the street. He knew he needed help. He didn't know which way to go about it. He, it's very hard for him to stay in any rehab for any length of time, but he tried it one more time. And on September 1st, he walked off of a rehab, and guess where he ended up? right here you guys he came right here and within hours he was stabbed and they took his grandfather's watch and his grandfather's necklace which his grandfather had died and you know that was sentimental to him but somebody's next high or it's probably in a pawn shop or whatnot but you know that that was something that his grandfather wore and he misses his grandfather every day so uh, Shaggy actually was bleeding out for several hours and nobody helped him. He was just laying there and finally, hours and hours later, he happened to see a police guy, uh, a policeman walk by and he got his attention and then he got to an ambulance. So, you know, he's, he's okay. 
um, he's still homeless, um, but a couple days ago, guess what, he got arrested. <laughs> he had warrants, and he's sitting, well, probably he could hear me if the windows were open, he's right in the, the main jail right now. Bottom line is, his mom knows where he is. Even if he's sitting in jail, she can go to bed tonight and think, well, he's getting three hots and a cot, and I know where he is. Even if you don't want to go home, if your mom knows that you're alive, sometimes that's enough. So if you're willing to pick up the phone or to hit them up on Facebook, or if you can come up to my table, I have stationery, we can send them a card, a letter, you know, this works both ways. I have parents looking for kids, but I have kids looking for parents. You know, and um, the reason why I do this is, you know, I know a mother's pain when you don't know where your only cub is, okay? It's not a good feeling. But it's also the most painful thing I've ever done, but also the most beautiful thing, because when you find somebody that's been missing and they pick up the phone and say, Hi, Mom. <laughs> There's no better feeling in the world. And I had an experience um, with a boy named Dakota. And Dakota is somebody that, if you've ever heard of the calling, I literally had a calling to find this boy. And what happened was um, I was at, uh, sent to, I went to work and I got sent home sick. I was coughing and they're like, you cannot be here, you're going to get everybody else sick. So I drove all the way home, it was a long drive from Long Beach to Aliso Viejo, and uh, I was tired. I walked in the door and I thought, I'm just going to lay down, and when I wake up I was going to go look for that boy Shaggy that I was talking about, because at that time he had been beaten up in the hospital and released, you know how they like to you know, check you into the hospital and release you right away even though you probably should still stay. Well, he should have still stayed, but they just bounced him out of the ER. And people were saying, you need to go check up on him. Something's wrong, he's really hurt. So I thought, I'm gonna go find Shaggy. So I said to myself, I'm gonna look for him after I take a little nap. I had a fever of about 102, and uh, it was like March, cold, rainy day. Soon as my head hit the pillow, and I'm not exaggerating, I heard the most booming voice say, go now, go now, go now! And it was so loud, you guys, I'm not kidding. It felt like the walls were vibrating. And I, th I said to myself, okay, I have a fever, right? Am I hallucinating or is this the voice of God? And I thought, well, <laughs> if it's the voice of God, I'm not ignoring it, and I'm just going. So I jumped up, I changed clothes, and I jumped in my car from Long Beach, and I flew to Costa Mesa. And when I got to Costa Mesa, the very first inkling I had was to get off on Victoria Street. And I exited, and within a minute, I see this boy, Dakota, and he's walking in the rain, barefoot, his clothes are in shreds, it's cold, his lips were almost blue. I looked at him and I said, what's your story? Can you come here and talk to me? And um, he said, well, you know, I, I left a rehab about eight months ago and I'm pretty sure my mom is so mad at me right now because I have blown so many chances. They have really good insurance and I can never finish a program and I know she's just so disappointed and I'm so ashamed. And I said, Dakota, did you talk to her when you left the rehab? Have you talked to her at all? He said, no. I said, oh my goodness. She, I can guarantee you, Dakota, she's not mad. Right now she's frantic. She's worried. I said, let's, let's go figure this out. So I took him to Goodwill. He picked out some clothes. You know what he did? He picked out men's dress pants, men's shirt, a men's button-up shirt. When he was walking in the rain that day, he was carrying a Wall Street Journal. And even though he was homeless, he's, he always wanted to be perceived as a businessman. It just struck me, and he said, you know, I always try to look nice when I'm on the street because 
maybe the cops won't hassle me as much. But, you know, look at me now. I haven't had new, you know, any clothes in a long time. Obviously, things get stolen right and left. I said, I said, just pick out what you want, you know. Get what you want, but give me your mom's number. That's all I ask. So while he was shopping, I uh, dialed his mom, and I said, hi, my name is Ellen. Is this Wendy? And she said, yes. I said, well, I have a young man here named Dakota, and he'd like to talk to you. And she went, oh, my gosh. She started crying, and she said, we have been looking for him for months. There's a missing person report. We didn't know if he was alive or dead. He's the oldest of 10 kids, and he has a son and a mother of that son that loves him in Arizona. He had family in Alaska. His dad was a pilot for Alaska Airlines. He was living, you know, hand to mouth on the street, thinking that he had shamed his family so, so, so much that he couldn't go home. And that was far from the question his mom's had it. His mom was like, are you okay? You know, not why did you do it? She didn't care. She, you know, being an addict, it's a process. How many people go to rehab and get it right the first time? I, I don't know that many. I know a lot of people that relapse over and over and then eventually they get it right and I wish I knew the sequence or what happens when the light goes on when they're ready and you know people say you hit your rock bottom well, heck my son has hit rock bottom so many times and has been in so many horrible situations that I can't believe he goes back and ends up in the same place you know and eventually hopefully he wants to get it right right now he's sitting in Theo Lacey jail and he says he's ready to do a program and you know I I see a light on his eyes when I go visit him that I haven't seen in, in a very long time. And, you know, as long as there's hope, he's still alive. He hasn't overdosed by some miracle. He's okay. But guess what? It didn't end up that well for Dakota. Dakota passed out and overdosed when he went to a rehab because somebody brought drugs in the rehab. And he had been clean for about eight months, and he had two months left, or actually two weeks left, and he was going to be released from this program because he had to do a few months in jail, and then he did rehab. Well, it's the same thing I was telling you about. You know, he did, took one dose, and he instantly just died. And when he died, a, I got to tell you, a piece of my heart died. Okay, the day I met him walking in the rain, when I got the calling, I can tell you we were destined to meet and at the very end of the day when I had was just saying goodbye to him and his mom had gotten him a little motel room and the next day I took him to a rehab um, what he what he did was um, you know I, I said listen Dakota the reason why I was out here is I was looking for another boy named Shaggy and you kind of look like him from behind so I picked up the the flyer and I showed him Shaggy's picture and he looked at it and he goes I know him I said what he said yeah I said well how do you know this kid that I thought I had the calling for to come out and find Shaggy the kid I found was Dakota who actually knew Shaggy and when I said to him how do you know Shaggy he said I was in the hospital with him on Monday night I said, yes, he was in the hospital because he got beat up. He goes, I was in the bed right next to him. I said, you're kidding me. You were in the bed right next to him? Why were you in the hospital? He said, I overdosed. I was brought to with Narcan and, you know, picked up off the sidewalk, and next thing I know, I was there. Well, those two became like brothers, you know, and when when Dakota died I had to go find Shaggy and he was living on the street and you know there's no good place or no good way but we didn't have anywhere even private to talk we were in a dog park <laughs> and uh, he must have cried for five or six hours I just sat on the bench with him and you know all it takes is one dose of a bad mix and there's fentanyl and everything right now and it could be your last time and you don't even know it. It's, and it's a gamble every time you use. And I know it's, it's hard to live out here like this. 
and it's going to get worse. I mean, we're heading into winter. We had a brutally hot summer. I always wonder what's worse, frying out here in the sun or freezing in the wet rain. I, I don't know. But none of you deserve to be here. And if any of you want to talk to your families, we can do it on any number of ways. I have a bunch of stationery. We can send them letters. You can use my mailing address, a, a P.O. box. I can put your name on it. You can come up to me. I have people using my best address to get IDs and to get their mail from their families. And you are more than welcome to come up here and talk to me about it. If you haven't talked to your families, the biggest gift you could do is just, hello, hello, I'm okay. It's a bridge that you can build maybe a little bit at a time, maybe all at once. You don't know what the other person's thinking, but if there's somebody that you can reach out to, you never know what that's going to do to your family when they at least hear from you. I was in a huge, deep depression for, I'm not kidding, years. I gained a ton of weight. I used to be super duper outgoing. And, you know, for the first four years of my son's addiction, I clammed up. You know, the, it was hard. It was hard to watch him over and over go back to the streets, back to jail, see him. He's six feet tall. I saw him once. He was 123 pounds. He looked like a skeleton. His mouth was moving. And I, I didn't even know how he was alive. I, I just kept staring at him like he looked dead. He really looked dead, but he was talking to me. And I, I didn't even know how he was alive, to be honest with you. But the human body is so resilient. He went and got help that time. And after a couple of months, his, you know, his face filled out again. And he, was, he, he bounced right back. Um, but you can bring yourself right to the brink. And then you think, I, it's okay, I can come back again and again and again. But... The more he relapses, the faster I see him kind of shriveling up. Each time he goes out on a run, it seems like he can actually go downhill within days and before it used to be weeks and before it used to be months. But like I saw him in five days once where he left a rehab and I didn't recognize him. His, his nose had gotten completely black from an infection. I thought it was going to fall off. His knee was blown out and so swollen he couldn't walk. He was laying on a, a street and people were just stepping over him in Santa Ana. And I went and got him and, you know, I had to pick him up and drag him in my car and take him to the hospital. And even after that, he went out on another run. So nobody knows when your limit is, when you're ready. Nobody's trying to tell you when you're ready. You know when you're ready. But just know that people are waiting for you to get ready. Because when you come out on the other side, there's a whole other life going on out there. I know it's every man for himself right now. You're in the thick of it. It's a survival mode. I know my son would tell me just being an addict is a full-time job. You have to make that hustle, figure out how you're going to get the money, whether you're panhandling or whatever you're doing. Then you figure out where to get the drugs, then you do the drugs, then you la 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 la, whatever, for a while, you spin out. Then it's time to do it all over again. And that's your existence, over and over and over again. And you're just trying to exist to chase the next high. Well, if we could figure out a new kind of high and replace it with whatever you're doing now and figure out a new normal, then you can find other things in life and know that there's people that are going to be there to help you, okay? My organization, TechSwitch, we do a lot more than just find them and feed them. I will help you till the end to get you to a rehab. I'll visit you in sober living. I'll visit you in jail. I'll go to court with you. I will help you get a job. I've had a volunteer help us get a girl a car she gave her a used car so that she could work she got her a job this girl had been living in a riverbed for three years her mom was in michigan and we call her miss magic that she had a tattoo called miss magic but she really was magic when we found her she was in a soup kitchen in costa mesa and the pastor there had noticed her very flyer sitting on their bulletin board and he said look at is this you 
And she looked at it and she said, oh my God, yeah. And he, she, he said, you're a missing person and your family's looking for you. And she said, oh my gosh, I, I didn't think of my, I think my family was super mad at me and she hadn't talked to him in like three years. So what, what happened was she said, I really feel like if I walk outside right now, I'm going to die. I need detox and I need to get off the street. And she didn't want to leave her boyfriend, but he wasn't ready. And she said, I'm going to take a leap of faith and leave him off right now I, I won't go back to him if you keep me safe and the, the man the pastor says look at this is an all men's shelter we it's a soup kitchen during the day but in over 20 years we've never had a female stay here it's just not allowed so let me make some phone calls let's see if we can find you a place and he frantically for hours and hours tried to find her a bed somewhere and there was no bed he looked at her and said look at I'm going to let you stay here. Yes. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but you're going to stay here. And she said they put a, a cot in the kitchen, and at night she would go to bed, and one man would be at the foot of her bed reading a Bible, and she would wake up the next morning, and another man would be sitting there. And the whole time it took 10 days for her to find a bed that had an opening, they stayed with her and used the buddy system. If she went outside to smoke, they went outside to smoke. She is the one that is now three weeks away from having a baby. She's getting married. That guy that she left on the street, when she didn't come back, he said, heck, I'll get help. I don't want to lose her. So he got help. She got help. They each went to a separate.